All right, we're in the home stretch here. This final batch of videos in the series is going to be about a trio of guys who I think of as sort of the big three of baseball's steroid era. Mark McGuire, Roger Clemens, and Barry Bonds. You can't really talk about the issue of steroids in baseball without talking about these three guys, who are more strongly associated with steroids than anyone else in baseball history, and who shape the common understanding of that era more than everyone else put together. And the reason they're so connected to steroids, aside from the strong evidence against all three of them, is that each of them did amazing, singular things that would seem to require some supernatural explanation. In other words, their stories are different from what I've talked about in previous videos. Not just a case of a great player having a great year, or a decent player having a career season, or a half-decent player becoming more than decent. No. All three of these guys did something literally unprecedented, and so steroids serve as a kind of convenient explanation. How was this guy able to do this amazing thing? Well, we know he used steroids, so it must have been that. So I'm going to go into some detail on all three of them, and obviously explain why I think that narrative is wrong. And today I want to start with Mark McGuire, who is kind of the original patient zero of the steroid era. It was McGuire's pursuit of the single season home run record in 1998, which is often credited, inaccurately I should say, but it is credited with bringing baseball back after the strike in 1994, and that record chase really defined the steroid era as an era of home runs. And unlike Clemens and Bonds, who always had complicated relationships with fans and the media, even before they were linked to drugs, McGuire had been almost universally beloved in the baseball community. So his fall from grace was in many ways the most tragic. It was a slow and painful downfall that took place over the course of a decade, from being baseball's biggest star in the late 1990s... Bye folks! Bye Mark McGuire! Ooh. Hey, Mac himself! Who'd have thunk it? Do you want to know the terrifying truth? Or do you want to see me sock a few dingers? Dingers! Dingers! dingers. dingers. Mm. To an embarrassing performance in front of Congress in 2005, which would turn into a legendary punchline. Like I've said earlier, I'm not going to go into the past and talk about my past. In addition to Andro, which was legal at the time that you used it, what other supplements did you use? I'm not here to talk about the past to eventually a full confession about his steroid use in 2010. I apologize to everybody in Major League Baseball. <laughs> My family, the Marises, but Selig, today was the hardest day of my life. <laughs> I've been wanting to come clean ever since 2005. And, you know, I didn't know where or when or how just been holding this in. <laughs> I should say that my own personal view of McGuire has changed a lot over that time, but in the opposite direction. I actually never liked him as a player, mostly because I was a Yankee fan as a kid, and I didn't like seeing Roger Maris's record fall to someone on another team. But as I've looked into these myths, I started to really feel bad for McGuire and even respect him. After all, of all the players implicated in baseball's steroid era, he's pretty much the only one who gave what actually seems like a full, honest confession. He didn't do that thing so many players do where they say, I only did it once, or I took a tainted supplement, or I wasn't using it during my best years. He acknowledged using steroids extensively throughout his career, including during his legendary 1998 season. And he apologized not just because he got caught, but because he wanted to get back into baseball as a coach. You might say that this is just the bare minimum, but it's more than basically anyone else implicated by the steroid era has ever done. And more importantly, for our purposes, it gives his confession a degree of credibility and detail that's rare in this subject. According to McGuire, he first tried steroids after the 1989 season, but quote, didn't think much of it, and he quit after a few weeks. Then, after an injury-plagued 1993 season, he began using them more seriously, and he used them, quote, on occasion throughout the 90s, including during the 1998 season, end quote. This allows us to roughly split McGuire's career into a before steroid period from his rookie season in 1987 through 1993 and an after steroids period from 1994 through his retirement in 2001. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier video, McGuire's motives for using steroids were actually health-related. He was trying to speed up recovery and prevent injuries. But as I discussed in that video, there's no evidence that steroids actually helped him with that. McGuire missed a higher percentage of his games after he began using steroids than before, and he had fewer healthier seasons on steroids than he did before he began using them. The real noteworthy thing about McGuire's years on steroids wasn't his health, it was his power. 
From 1996 to 1999, McGuire hit 245 home runs, the most home runs ever over a four-year stretch. Prior to those seasons, only Babe Ruth had ever hit more than 200 over a four-year period, and even he only made it to 206. McGuire led the majors in home runs all four of those seasons. Again, nobody besides Ruth has ever had the solo lead in home runs for four straight seasons. And obviously, famously, McGuire shattered the single-season home run record in 1998, getting all the way to 70, nearly 15% more home runs than anyone had ever hit in a season before. And so now that we know he was using steroids during that time, it seems like an obvious explanation for this unprecedented binge in home runs. Anyone like me trying to dispel the steroid myths has to reckon with this simple question. How did Mark McGuire hit all those home runs? Well, there's really two parts to this question. There's how did Mark McGuire hit all those home runs? And then there's how did Mark McGuire hit all those home runs? Let's start with the first one. All those home runs. Where did they come from? Well, as I've said many times in this series, the late 1990s was one of the most home run friendly eras in baseball history. From the end of World War II through 1993, there had been exactly one season when Major League Baseball averaged more than two home runs per game. That was 1987, the famous rabbit ball year. But then the number fell back down around 1.5 the next year, where it had been for decades. In home run friendly years like 1961, when Mantel and Maris each hit more than 50 home runs, the home run rate was about 1.8 per game. In pitcher friendly years like 1968, it was around 1.23. But then, starting in 1994, the number passed two home runs per game and stayed there all the way through 2009. And because 94 and 95 were strike shortened seasons, 1996 through 1999, the exact years of Mark McGuire's binge, were the first fall seasons in this new home run friendly environment. As a result, the league saw home run totals that it just wasn't used to, as I discussed in the video on Brady Anderson. Now, as I've said before, the most likely explanation for this change was the change to the ball. But even if you don't buy that, the change was clearly structural. That is, it wasn't specific to Mark McGuire or to a specific subset of steroid users. Here's a list of some of the best four-year home run stretches over the entire course of Major League Baseball history prior to 1993. This is a list that includes the best stretches by the best home run hitters in the history of baseball. It's mostly Hall of Famers at their absolute peak. And now, just for a comparison, here's a list of the most home runs over a four-year stretch, just limiting it to the late 1990s, that is years that overlapped with McGuire's stretch, and not including confirmed steroid guys like McGuire or Sammy Sosa or Barry Bonds. Look at that list. Yes, it includes some Hall of Famers, but it also includes some pretty forgettable names like Sean Green and Greg Vaughn and Vinny Castilla, and some guys who weren't really known as home run hitters like Chipper Jones who only finish in the league's top 10 in homers once. Remember, this is a list that excludes any player with a firm connection to steroids like McGuire, Sosa, Rafael Palmeiro, Juan Gonzalez, and is just limited to a specific eight-year window, and yet it still compares evenly with the best home run stretches by the best home run hitters of all time. In other words, the juice ball environment that began in 1993 made pretty good home run hitters look historically great based on their home run totals, and for someone who was already elite, it made them look supernatural. Look at Ken Griffey Jr., who was never tied to steroids. He hit 209 home runs from 1996 to 1999, more than anyone, including Babe Ruth, had ever hit in a four-year stretch, and he just happened to do it the exact same four-year window as Mark McGuire, because all home run hitters all across the league were benefiting from the same structural factors that increased home run totals. It's just that McGuire benefited the most. But that brings us back to the second version of our initial question. Remember, the first was, how did Mark McGuire hit all those home runs? And the answer seems to be, well, the same way everyone was hitting all those home runs, from Carlos Delgado to Jim Tomei. But people will often push back and say, well, how did Mark McGuire hit those home runs? After all, home runs went up for everyone, but McGuire hit the most. He went from averaging around 36 home runs per season before the juiced ball to 61 after, an increase of nearly 70% which is way more than the league average, and obviously his totals were atop the league for all four of those years, 96 to 99. So a common rejoinder to the juice ball hypothesis is to say, well, fine, home runs may have increased due to changes in the ball, but McGuire was best positioned to take advantage of those changes because of his steroid use. 
If we look at that stretch from 96 to 1999 and say, well, Griffey averaged about 52 home runs per year those seasons, and McGuire averaged about 61, so maybe steroids explain that nine home run difference. That's not nothing. But the mistake here is assuming that McGuire was just an average home run hitter whose increase should mirror the league average. Remember, the league-wide home run rate went up by about 40% after the juice ball was introduced. But it's not as if average changes like that apply equally to everyone. When inflation is at 5%, for example, it's not like the price of every single product goes up by exactly 5%. Some prices go up by 10% or more, some prices go up by like 1%, some don't change at all. Similarly, when the home run rate around the league goes up by 40%, you'd expect there to be some variance with some guys experiencing big spikes, maybe even doubling their totals, and other guys not seeing much change at all. Fred McGriff, for example, is someone whose home run totals didn't really budge after the juice ball for some reason. But usually you'd expect someone like Mark McGuire, who was already really good at hitting home runs, to take more advantage of the juice ball than your average hitter. See, Mark McGuire was about as pure of a home run hitter as there ever was in baseball history. McGuire really didn't do a lot of things well. He was not fast. He couldn't steal bases or hit triples, and he hit into a fair amount of double plays. He played first base, which is not a particularly important defensive position, and he didn't play it especially well. He didn't hit for a high batting average. He was a career 263 hitter and only once hit over 300 for a full season. He didn't even really hit that many doubles or singles. He never hit more than 28 doubles in a season, and he never had as many as 89 singles in a season. As a result, his RBI totals were always lower than you'd expect given all those home runs. He led the league in homers five different times, but RBIs only once. Basically, Mark McGuire did two things really well. He hit home runs, and he drew walks. And he drew walks largely because he was so good at hitting home runs. So of course, when there was a change in the league that made it easier to hit home runs, he was well positioned to take advantage of it. Hitting home runs was what Mark McGuire did well. It's how he got to the big leagues in the first place. But that's not because of steroids. It's because he was an all-time great home run hitter, before he started using drugs. For example, everyone remembers that McGuire was the only player to reach at least 50 home runs every year from 1996 to 1999, because 50 is such a cherished mark. But McGuire was also the only player in baseball who hit at least 30 home runs every year from 1987 to 1990, hitting more home runs over his first four years in the big leagues, 153, than anyone else in baseball. It's just that in a lower home run hitting environment, those numbers didn't stand out as much but McGuire's home run totals were already elite from the minute he started playing the game. So because he was starting from a higher level when the juice ball was introduced, his home run totals in the late 90s were higher than everyone else's. Put it this way, if we look back at our list of non-steroid guys who hit the most home runs over a four-year stretch in the 90s, you actually see guys with even bigger percentage jumps in their home run totals. For example, Jeff Bagwell went from averaging 24 home runs per year from 1991 to 1996 to 42 per season over his peak, a 75% jump. Andreas Galarraga went from averaging around 20 home runs per year to about 40, practically doubling his total. And Ken Griffey Jr., he was only averaging 22 home runs per year from 1989 to 1992 before the ball was juiced, and he averaged 52 from 1996 to 1999. That's a 136% increase. By this standard, McGuire's 70% jump doesn't seem that unusual. And look, there are many complicating factors to why somebody's home run totals would change, and you can play with the numbers a lot of different ways. Griffey was younger, so he was coming into his prime, so maybe you'd expect a bigger jump from him than from someone else. Some guys switch ballparks or adjust their swings. There are lots of reasons why a player's home run totals might change significantly. But the important thing about McGuire specifically is that he was not unusual either in seeing his home runs increase in the late 90s, almost everyone saw that, or the rate of that increase, which wasn't that unusual. What did make McGuire unusual were the home run totals he reached, but that was really a function of him already being such a good home run hitter before the juiced ball and before he started using drugs. So when we ask that question, how could Mark McGuire hit so many home runs in the late 1990s? There are really two parts to the answer. One is that Mark McGuire was an elite home run hitter. We know this was unrelated to steroid use because it was true before he ever started using steroids from his very first season in the big leagues on. And the second part of the explanation is that the late 1990s were just a very home run friendly environment. And we know this was unrelated to steroids because it was a league wide trend that impacted non steroid users as much and sometimes more than it affected confirmed steroid users. In other words, even though we know McGuire used performance enhancing drugs, there's just no reason at all to believe it actually enhanced his performance. What we have here is really quite simple. 
It's just a case of an unusually good home run hitter playing at a time when it was unusually easy to hit home runs. Of course his totals were unusually high. But there is no need for any kind of magical or chemical explanation. And yet Mark McGuire's home run binge shaped how we think of these drugs. Even though none of the other steroid users, over decades and decades of steroid use, ever came close to this type of output ever again, we still think of steroids as magic home run beans, all because of this one guy, Mark McGuire, and this one four-year stretch in the late 90s. It really speaks to the power of mythology and the hold these stories have over fans. But we can and should look past these myths and realize the truth, which is that steroids did not cause McGuire's home run surge.